Well, let's take our Bibles, if you would. I'm glad you're here tonight. Thanks for coming to First Baptist Church. A blessing to see you. But we get to look at the Word of God, which is the biggest blessing. We get to hold in our hands something that is eternal, that is the Word of life. This Word, the Word of God, will be around forever. So the Bible says, forever. We hold something eternal. We can read something eternal. And what a blessing that is, that you don't have to come to Jesus Christ through someone else. You don't have to wait for me to read the passage and interpret it for you. All right, that is another religion. My friends, you are a high priest. Or you can boldly access the throne of grace all by yourself. God can speak to you individually. Aren't you thankful for Jesus Christ? That's what Jesus Christ did. He, when he died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn in half. Torn in half, showing that anyone, anyone can access God. And you can go to God. What a blessing that is. Well, I'm glad you're Isaiah chapter 22 tonight. Isaiah chapter 22 in your Bibles. And, of course, you're welcome to use the one in the pew in front of you as well. For you may do not have the page number, so someone around them can help. Someone who's using that Bible. And so you can follow along in the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 22. It's a great church, great people, but it's because we serve a great God. The church, the foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. And any goodness, any good thing from the church is because of Jesus Christ. Any bad thing is our flesh and humanity. Because Jesus is the chief cornerstone, the head, the chief shepherd. He is the foundation of the church. And I love this, this church because of Jesus Christ and because we have a lot of great Christians here, those who just follow Jesus Christ. I'm glad you're here. Isaiah chapter 22 Isaiah is, as we jump into the middle of this book, we've been there for a few weeks now, is a lot of depth. There's a lot of context, there's a lot of deep thoughts and truths, a prophecy, things, that, uh, passages of Scripture that, that people would not necessarily place up on their wall in their home, not because it's not good, but because some of it's just deep. Some of it you scratch your head at when you read. And, and as we continue through Isaiah, there will be those passages of Scripture that, that will become very familiar. Most, if not everyone here, understands and has heard the passage about soaring as an eagle, like an eagle. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's from Isaiah. But it's another 20 chapters from now, just so you know. And before we get to some of those powerful truths, these truths no less powerful, but, but a little bit deeper. And you've noticed that if you've been on Sunday nights, you're like, man, sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit weedy if I can, like in the weeds. But there are truths found inside of Isaiah that will help us grow. And then there are truths we come across. We came across one we will tonight where it's a timeless truth. I believe that as we un un uncover and unpack this particular passage of Scripture, you're going to understand that, that there are some truths that we find in the Bible, though maybe used in a certain context, culture, and people, that surpass all of that context and really are a timeless, absolute truth. They may be illustrated through a historical time and event, but what happens and what we understand is that this truth is true, and that humanity has not changed much after all. That in reality, men and women, boys and girls, the flesh is the same. Whether it is 2024 or 2000 BC, that men and women struggle with the same tendencies though perhaps the context looks a little bit different. We are still selfish. Yes or no? We're still selfish. We are still complainers. Yes or no? The same things the children of Israel struggled with, we can struggle with as well. Humanity has not changed all that much. The natural course and base desires of our hearts that we resist are still the same desires that these people in Isaiah chapter 22 face. And God, in his sovereignty, in Isaiah chapter 22, will open up the, if I can, the curtain of heaven for a moment. He will try to deal with an issue here in Isaiah chapter 22, but in reality, 
or if I can present to us tonight, this is a similar issue that you and I face with. Or in essence, even though we're going to read about Isaiah 22, which, which talks about, about the, um, the children of Israel, we know that from the very first verse, the burden of the valley of vision, that's referring to those who had the vision from God, the word of God, so we know it's now turning back to children of Israel, that what they are dealing with, God could have easily and simply inserted our name. He could have said the burden of the valley of First Baptist Church with no truth lost, with no situation lost. Because the truth that, that God is trying to impart to these Israelites is a truth that you and I must learn. Imagine a universe where God knows everything. Just imagine it. Is it hard? Imagine a universe where God created everything. But then imagine a place where God, since creation, has seen over and over and over again the frailty, the foolishness of mankind. And he still loves. How much patience do you have? Maybe more than the person next to you. Maybe the most in this room. But in comparison to that universe where God knows everything and where God created everything and where God has seen the frailty of mankind over and over and over again, our patience is nothing in comparison to his. Yes, no, yes. And yet God still demonstrates compassion. He still loves and he still calls. If you would look, please, we'll find ourselves in the middle of this text, of this, of this chapter for our text. We'll be eventually in verse number 12. What we find in the first 12 verses are just a description of what they've done. How they have rejected God. How they've turned away from God at seemingly every point. You can look at it later on, but it's just repeatedly and through some of their descriptions, all right, in the ways that they did that. If this was a chapter describing you and I, the description would look different. All right, we, we would, it would be different words used, but no less rejecting God. And then in verse number 12, please, if I can draw your attention to verse 12, 13, and 14, where the Bible says this, and in that day, did the Lord God of hosts, and what's the next word? Call. Call. Tonight, what happens when God calls? What happens when God calls? Lord, as we look at your word, I ask that you would reveal these truths to us. These truths are not naturally discerned. Lord, they are spiritually discerned. And so I need your Holy Spirit. We need your Holy Spirit tonight in this room, in our hearts, that you would imprint upon us the foundational truth found here, Lord, in Isaiah chapter 22. And then would your Spirit convincingly, with compassion and grace, Lord, help us to respond to it in the right way. That if there is a, a place that is not responding correctly, Lord, an attitude, a, a spirit in, in our heart or in another area, that we would, through your grace and your goodness, which calls us to repentance, just deal with you. And Lord, if we deal with you, then you will deal with us with mercy and forgiveness and grace. And Lord, we are so grateful for that. So Lord, I pray for your help. I want to give you the praise and glory and will honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Most, if not all, adults in this room have a cell phone. And like most cell phones, it probably rings regularly. Or safe to say, all of the time. With the majority of calls coming in, we well, have a contact. You can see the person. Caller ID. 
What a blessing of this century. Yes or no? Say, wow, you know what? I see who's calling. And then you make that split decision. Do I pick up or do I ignore it? How many have ever been faced with that split decision? How many, again, we're going to use our hands for a moment, so be ready. How many have seen that number that is calling you and thought, man, I've been waiting for this call, and you eagerly snap the accept and grab that phone. Man, it's great to hear from you. I've been waiting for this. How many? Absolutely. How many have seen the, that name on that caller ID? And you're like, oh. Huh. Thanks, Linda. Appreciate that. I got some honesty there. All of us who have a cell phone know what I'm talking about. You're like, I don't have time for this call right now. I only have three hours. I know what they want, and I don't want to deal with this right now. I don't know what they want, but generally what they want is not good. For whatever reason, we're like, beep, ignore. Now, if you live in my life, my phone goes through cycles. There'll be an hour, no phone calls, and then four of you will call in the space of 15 seconds. It's just the way my phone rings. Boom, 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 boom. I'm like, man, this is crazy. You know? So if you could help me and space it out, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> we'll post it online like space available. No, no. We've had these calls come through. We ignore, accept. And then there are the dreaded unknown numbers. Anybody with a cell phone ever receive an unknown number? Or the, the numbers that are listed, but you just don't know who they are? Spam calls? Yes? You pick it up and find out that your car warranty is expired. Your house warranty is expired. You're expired and going to jail because the IRS are after you front pay taxes. Uh, there's, a, there's a man in, in Africa who's lots of gold that if you help him, he'll, he'll get it for you. Or whatever the, 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 the scam may be. And so we begin to develop a natural cynicism to a number that's not in our phone. Yes or no? And yet sometimes, though you see that number, you're like, I think this is somebody I know. And you answer it and you're severely disappointed. But what happens when God calls? God doesn't call through our cell phone, typically. No, he could, but he doesn't. God speaks in a still, small voice. He speaks through time with his word. He speaks at, in a message during church. God will speak to us through his word. The Holy Spirit will impress upon us biblical thoughts and concepts that are confirmed with his word. But what happens when God calls? It'd be nice if we could say, well, I always pick up. I always answer God's call. But if I were to ask that question, have you always answered the call of God in your life? You would have to say, no. Here the Bible says, and in that day, verse number 12, did the Lord God of hosts call. That word calls, call means to summon. Yeah, think of how a jury, you'll be summoned to a jury. You don't receive, right, Brother Bonner, you have that, don't you, coming up here? I think you do, right? We don't receive that summons with excitement, do we? I mean, maybe you do. I, I don't. I've received it a few times. And how many have had that summons for jury duty? Does it not seem like, we're the, like I'm the only one who serves in all of Saginaw, all the world? You, anybody else? Multiple times? I know you have. Anybody else? Multiple times? You see that summons, you're like, man. And yet here God says, I'm calling. I'm summoning something here. I'm summoning these people, my people, and he's summoning to a certain reaction. The Bible goes on to say this, I am summoning, I am calling, I am requiring your attention to this. Here's what, what the words he used. He says, I'm calling to weeping, to mourning, to baldness, and to girding with sackcloth. Now you may think, well, pastor, I thought you said this was a, was a timeless truth. I mean, Brother Ash, you're like, I've got the ball this down, so I've listened to the call of God. But, but, but what is God asking here? Is he asking us and the children of Israel to, to now strip off and, and wear terrible, rough clothes? Or what is God asking? And what is happening here 
is God has presented the case that his people have strayed from his way. They've rejected his truth, and now God says, I am calling you back to repentance. I'm calling you back to my way, and it begins with repentance or a change, a turning around. This, these words describe a few things. Ultimately, the word we could use to describe all of these actions, outward actions that will display an inward transformation is humility. You could weep and not be repentant, could you not? You could mourn and not be repentant. You could shave your head, you could put on other clothes and not be repentant. But God never asks just for outward actions, does he? Nowhere in the Bible does God say, I only care about the outside and the inside doesn't matter. No, in fact, the opposite is true throughout the entire scripture. That God cares about the outside, but he cares more about the inside. And God says what's inside will come out. So you can't just put good things on the outside. You must be good on the inside. So God is calling to repentance and humility. All the outward displays of an inward response. When we look at the Old Testament and see how the children of Israel would repent, it would involve these actions. You would weep. You would mourn for your sin and over your sin. You would shave your head to display that you were sincere, and you would strip off your normal clothes and put on these, these thick, coarse sackcloth, the Bible says, to display to everyone else, listen, I am serious, all right, I am serious about what's going on here. Or in essence, God asks for three change. He asks for a change of thinking. That's the weeping part. Like my thoughts must be different. I'm weeping because where I thought I was okay, now I realize I've messed up. The change of thinking. You know, the, the, the repentance involves a change of thinking in your life. You just can't add on a different action. Listen, I'm just going to be a good Christian, so I'm just going to go to church. Now, I'm glad you come to church, but that doesn't equal a repentance and, and right before God. It begins with a change of thinking, weeping. It also is a change of desire. That's the mourning. We will see this flushed out in the following verses. But in the morning, that, that word mourning is the idea that you are, you are sad and, and you're, like, nothing will appease what's inside here. Like, I, I, am, I, I feel sick. I feel twisted. It may be even a situation where, where grief has been so much that you didn't even feel like eating. You're like, I don't even feel like eating because my, my insides are all twisted up. I'm, I'm, all just, uh, I'm, I'm unsettled here. That's that idea of mourning. I'm just, oh, I'm completely turned around here. So there's a change of thinking. There's a change of my desire. And then there's a change that is evident to others. That is baldness and sackcloth. Well, I'm, listen, no one's going to doubt where I sit on this. When you look at that guy, you say, wow, there's something happening with him. It's not hidden. We can reference another time this happened in Job chapter 1. At the end of, of the, all of the, the happenings in Job's life where he lost all of his wealth, and his cattle, and then his children were taken. The Bible says, then Job arose, and he rent his mantle, and he shaved his head, and he fell down upon the ground. And the Bible attaches one other phrase with what Job did, and this is beautiful and worshiped. When God calls us to repentance, you know what he's really calling us to? Worship. Acknowledging him for who he is. Acknowledging in this universe the one who knows all things, the one who created all things, the one who sees all, the one who has the best plan. And that, if that is not worship, what is worship? Worship is not just singing a few songs in church or raising a hand or two hands and, and saying Amen. That can be part of worship. No, my friends, worship is when I take my, my life and I throw myself before an almighty God and say, God, listen, I've sinned, I've messed up, use me. I, I, I bow every bit of me, my desire and my thinking, Lord, even my enjoyment, I bow it to you and I worship you. So just give me my marching orders. And, and, I, and I won't leave, I won't get up until I know that you and I are all right. And Job at that moment, no doubt, was in such, was such agony, saying, God, I don't know what the problem is, 
but I need you. Yet God calls the children of Israel. And there's that call, if I can, to repentance. God doesn't always call the same way. Sometimes he calls loudly. And sometimes he prompts in a simple way. But the call is no less sincere. The call is no less serious. And the question is, when God speaks to you, when God speaks to me, do we answer? Do we answer? How quick are we to answer? How quick are we to, to acknowledge what God is doing? How quick are we to pick up the phone from God and say, you rang? I'm glad to hear from you, Lord. You see, what often happens, and this is the, the natural way, is there is a subtle rejection. And the Bible displays what happens here in verse number 13. Because in verse number 12, God has called, and he said, I want you to, to weep and to mourn and, and to, to shave your head and to gird with sackcloth. Verse number 13, and behold joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. What happens here is there's a shift in these, in these two verses that at first glance you may miss, but I think as I explained, it, it'll make sense. God is describing the situation, and God has said, I have called. And then, in a, in a sense, God narrates, narrates the response. And so he is called, he said, weep and mourn and baldness and sackcloth, but then he is saying, and behold, or in essence, and look what happens. And look what the answer is. And look what the response is. And behold, and we know that because how the verse starts, and then in the middle, we have some words given. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we shall die. All right, so God is now narrating the one who sees everything. Imagine that universe again. He is called, and now he's describing what happens with the children of Israel, and the timeless truth what often happens with us. What I notice here is God was not actively rejected, but passively ignored. Now think about that. It would be one thing if God calls and we take our fist and shake it in God's face. We would shudder, shudder to do that and to think that if you saw someone responding that way, you would fear for their life, would you not? Would you think, God, be careful, don't, don't strike them dead. I'm going to move away from them. Yet, there is no less rejection when we passively just snub and ignore God. You ever been ignored? Snubbed? In a passive way? By a child? Anybody been ignored by a child? Right, now, I know door, uh, adults can ignore us, right, but when a child ignores you, come on now, has a child ever ignored you, yes or no? How many have had their own child ignore them for a second? Leslie, your hand's not raised, but I won't even ask you. Yeah, no, no. No, we have. I mean, ch ch children tr tr try this thing. They, they ignore this, right? And it's, it's different. If, a, if an adult ignores you, one of your friends, teenager ignores you, you're like, well, that hurts. That hurts. Why do they ignore me? They think they're better than me? What's wrong with them? I'm better than them. Look at them, and they look funny, and they smell funny. But when a child ignores you, the thinking is different, is it not? Who is this little creature? To echo the words that I heard from my father once, I brought you in this world, and I can take you out. <laughs> no, it's just joking when he said that. But, but, but our minds change, and we're like, who is this little two-year-old? Who do you think you are to ignore me? Do you not know, as a parent, all the things I do for you? Do you not know all the way I provide for you and, and watch over you and care for you? The, the times that I've had sleepless nights and, and early mornings and, and I've sacrificed for you. I've given myself for you. Like, I've labored for you. Your moms, you're like, I, I birthed you. 
and you're going to ignore me? And yet, that's what the Bible says the children of Israel have done and did here to God. And the timeless truth is, my friend, as Christians, we do the same thing. As God's child, we can be guilty of the same snubbing and ignoring of the God of the universe. Notice what they did here. All they did was they decided three things. They decided to continue their enjoyment. Behold the joy and gladness. They just decided to just continue what they're doing. I'm good enough. Life is good. I'm enjoying myself. God, I don't need you to, to weigh in on my actions, on my thoughts, or anything about me. I, I don't need your conviction in my life. I just want to continue my own path. I'm enjoying myself. They decided to continue enjoyment. They decided just to ignore anything else. They were slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating flesh, drinking wine. And then they decided to make a gamble. And let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. I'll just take my chances on the way I see things. The man, his name was Ted. He's criticizing conservative Christianity. He said this, Jesus, he said this, Jesus would probably be sick at his stomach over the ways his ideas have been twisted by today's preachers. Ted made these remarks at a banquet in Orlando, Florida. <clears throat> he was given an award on behalf of the environment and some world peace actions he had done. But Ted said this, he had been brought up in a strict Christian upbringing and at one time, Ted even considered seriously becoming a missionary. Of course, this conversation, he said, he laughed and said, well, I've probably been saved seven or eight times. But I became disenchanted with Christianity. And then he said, the more I strayed from my faith, the better I felt. When someone ignores the calling of God. You know, you can feel better after ignoring God's call in your life. You won't be better, I won't be better, but we can feel better. Or we can say this passage this way, when God calls us to repent, don't party instead. When God calls us to repent, to change, don't party instead, because that's what they did. And so there's the truth where there's the call to repentance. There's the truth where there's a subtle rejection. But then there's a simple revelation found in verse number 14. Where God says, this, and it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts. Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die, saith the Lord God of hosts. Or in essence, what God is saying here is... What happens here is inescapable. Do you know that God is certain? We are uncertain. That God and his word is inescapable. It's inescapable. We can delay it, but he is inescapable. Ultimately, God always wins. Every bit of life and everything, we can prove it to be true and, and live the blessings, prove it to, to be true and reject it, but God is inescapable. And here are the two truths I want you to think about tonight that are true back with these Israelites and true to us as well. That one, that man thinks, man is tempted to think that what he sees is more real than what he doesn't see. We're tempted to think that what I see, what I can touch, is more real than what I can't see and touch. That the enjoyment I receive today and the feeling I have in this situation is more real and more genuine than this nebulous thought of God in that moment. And that what I do apart from God will have no real accountability. That I can... Prove God wrong. 
Now, we won't say that, but that's how we live. Now, now, let me tie this together for us, okay? Because when I read these verses, some of you connected the dots. And if not, we'll get there in just a minute. You're going to see where this is true, and it's even in Scripture. All right, that, that understand this, that there is no advantage apart from God. What I see is not more real than what I don't see. So I need you to, to turn two places, because Scripture interprets Scripture. Look again at Isaiah chapter 22, and look at verse number 13, end of the verse where the Bible says, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall what? We shall die. Hold your finger there, please, and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll be ultimately in three different passages after this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where the apostle Paul, thousands of years later, but under the inspiration of the same Holy Ghost, is arguing for the resurrection. All right, in the resurrection, he has said that as a Christian, the resurrection is the key to the gospel. All right, that there is life after this that this is not all there is. There is more advantage because of the resurrection. This is what he says in verse number 32. If after the manner of men I have fought with the beast at Ephesus. So that means he, he wrestled with, with the beast like he was put on trial, had to wrestle like the lions, those things. If I fought, all right, what advantage did it me if the dead rise not? And look at what he says. Let us eat and drink. Look at it. What does it say? Read it with me. For tomorrow, yeah. Isaiah 22, direct quotation. Paul's quoting Isaiah 22. And he's pointing out, listen, this stuff doesn't matter if that's all there is to life. But because there is a God of the universe, advantage comes, all right, what I can't see is a whole lot more important than what I can see. Aren't you glad that what we can't see is more important than what we can see? No, no, that, that really, that, that what we have in our bank account, what we drive home tonight from the parking lot, that what we have is not as advantageous as what we, we're going to get one day with Jesus Christ. That what I can't see is better than what I can see. You see, there's advantage. But now turn over to Luke chapter 12. Now, some of you thought of this guy. I know you did, you Bible scholars in here. Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12... Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ gives a parable. He gives a story. And here's a story beginning in verse number 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Verse 18. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now he, in this parable, does not quote Isaiah 22, does he? He quotes the first part in this parable, eat and drink. But God, in verse 20, quotes the rest of it. Because God is inescapable. And God said unto him, verse 20, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he laid up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And God says, what you see is not as important as what you don't see. And that last verse says, so is he that is not rich toward God. How do we find richness nor toward God? It is not laying up what I just give in the offering. It is the fact that I live a life of worship in humility, the change of thinking, right? The change of desire and the change of outward actions that will please a holy God, a life of worship. That's how I please a holy God. That's how we become rich before God. When Jesus Christ does such a work on the inside that's displayed on the outside. Someone would say, well, you only live once. And that's so true. You only live once. But with Jesus Christ, you'll live forever. 1969, Mississippi. 
a group of people having a hurricane party. The sore storm was named Camille, and the police came to get them to evacuate the apartments. Story goes, the apartments, the Richelieu apartments, were less than 250 feet from the surf. The partiers, many already drunk, and just laugh at the police order to leave. This is my land. If you want me off, you'll have to arrest me. They wouldn't change their desire. They wouldn't change their thinking, and they would not be humble before the call from the police. Finally, the police wrote down the names of the next of kin of the 20 people gathered there. At 10.15, the storm came on shore, and the winds at that point, 250 feet off the surf, were 205 miles an hour. And the waves were 22 to 28 feet high. We hear that storm, we think, wow, that storm is inescapable. Can I remind you of this universe where God knows everything, where God sees everything, where God, every, where God created everything, the universe that you and I happen to live in? And a 22-foot wave is nothing compared to God. Only survivor was a five-year-old boy clinging to a mattress, by the way. Hmm. After the Cold War, a squadron of Russian pilots they were invited to participate in a U.S. Air Force base tactical war games to demonstrate collaboration. A dinner was planned, and thinking to relax the guests, a base commander offered a toast to open the meal. Smiling, he lifted his glass, and in Russian said this, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you may die quoting this particular phrase. They said that the Russian pilots became very quiet at hardly ate, and most left quite early. Thinking that perhaps the food wasn't quite their liking, one of the, com the commander asked the Russian pilot, one of the pilots, what, did, what, what happened? Is the food not to your liking? And the Russian pilot said this. He said, well, comrade commander, I thought it was going well until your toast. I don't know what you were meaning to say, but this is what came out. Feast and drink and be happy, for tomorrow we will kill you. You see, no matter how you interpret it, eat, drink, and be merry is terrible advice. You see, Ted, seven or eight times, said he got saved. That Ted is Ted Turner head of Turner Broadcasting, worth $2.5 billion today, owns almost 2 million acres of land. The Bible says, for what doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So can we look at one more passage and we'll close with that passage, Revelation chapter 3. We're going to read about the church of Laodicea. Revelation 3, beginning in verse 14. I want you just to now, in light of what we have learned from Isaiah, where God makes a call, and people ignore that call passively, subtly, for their own enjoyment, hear what Jesus Christ says here in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. And under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, and thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing. 
And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and, what's the next word? Repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, and he with me. The call of God. What happens when God calls? I don't mean what happens theologically. I mean personally. I mean in your life, and in your life, and in your life, and in your life, and in my life. What happens when God calls? Because we all have a choice to make. We respond. Or we reject. But, but, God is inescapable. The universe where he knows everything, he created everything, he sees everything, and he wants to fellowship with us. We have to simply let him in. Pick up the phone, hit answer, and respond. And then he does everything else. What a blessing. Lord.